and earth, Lord Jesus, we will praise and worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we thank you, Lord, for your presence here. Thank you, Lord, for just welcoming us, Lord, in your, in your presence, in your kingdom. And God, we, Lord, we just want to focus on you today, Lord. Just leave everything behind, Lord, that we worry, Lord God. But we want to say, Lord, that we are so thankful, Lord, for all the things that you've done for us, Lord for how you've carried us, Lord, throughout the years, Lord. So right now, Lord, we just open up our spirits, open up our hands to you, Lord. Lord, we join your creation. We join, Lord Jesus, your kingdom, Lord God. And just, they're just proclaiming your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord, to us, Lord God. Bless you, Lord. Psalm 19, 1 through 4. 
heavens declare the glory of God. Yes, Jesus. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from yet from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Yes, Jesus. Heavens declare your glory and your majesty, Lord. And you reign above us all, Lord Jesus. You reign above us all, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, God. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light. In the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life. You're the king of my life. Sing it again. The reign of darkness now is ended. The reign of darkness now is ended. In the kingdom of light. In the kingdom of light. Forever run to your dominion. You're the king of my life, God. You're the king of my life. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. On the cross, the work is finished. Lord, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, hear the anthem I'm 
of your kingdom, of your reign, of your glory, Lord. Sing hallelujah to you. Day and night, your creation sings you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy is the one who sits upon the throne. Jesus, Jesus. Lord, and here on earth, Lord, we join your creation. Just worship you. We worship you, Jesus. You bring life. 
into the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken
wonders and your deeds, O living my lips and my heart sanctify me with your blood holy is the Lord Psalm 136 says oh give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. We thank you, God, because your love endures forever. The things that we have of this earth, they're temporary and they're fleeting, God. But it is your love, it is your goodness, it is your mercy, it is your kindness that endures forever. Yes, Jesus. We're thankful, we're so thankful, God, that you are consistent and constant in our lives. That no matter what is changing around us, that it is your steadfast love that endures forever. If you have been a recipient of the steadfast love of God that endures forever, I just encourage you to just lift your hands. We say thank you, God. We say thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We praise you, God. It is your breath in our lungs this morning, Lord, yes, as we yes. sing. It is your breath that fills us. It is your goodness that fills us. It is your mercy that fills us. And so we collectively breathe in together. Yes. And exhale knowing that it is you who sustains us, Lord. it's in your name that we pray and we worship this morning and all God's people together said amen 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 amen, amen, amen. Yeah, I, pl I hope some of you plan on staying for uh, our workshop first ever we've never done something like this uh, after service uh, Bible 101 uh, today we're going to just you know start pretty simple what's what is this what we've we been talking about and I know some of us have been around the Bible for our whole lives and others of us maybe just <laughs> Uh, a year or so or less and some of us were around it a lot more maybe decades ago but it's been a while and uh and so we're just gonna uh yeah just start kind of working our way through and like karen said this may or may not have been put the finishing touches slightly before midnight um had a few things going on today but uh i'm excited about it i mean if you know anything about me this it's kind of i enjoy preaching you know i enjoy sunday mornings but i spend five days a week teaching uh, Bible and it's like uh, so I feel like this is part of my jam but like like that like going there where I just get to nerd out a bit and and be super nerdy and uh, bring you along with me in that so I hope it's helpful and I hope you can stay and I just heard we're, we just ordered more pizza because like 12 more people just signed up um, so <laughs> thank you for so timely RSVPing so we can prepare for food, but the 12 of you who just signed up, um, more. So that's awesome. So we'll convert this room into a little classroom and just go with that uh, until whenever. And we're going to do this again next month, uh, third Sunday of every month uh, for this spring until summer. And so we'll just kind of take it as far as we can go today. And then in a month, we'll do more until we just meander our way through. And if you're going to get all the answers to what the Bible, oh goodness. People give their entire lives to this, uh, so we'll start scratching the surface this afternoon together while we eat good Italian food. All right, anyway, 
Uh, there's that going on today, but we're also going to launch something brand new up here in this room um, during our teaching time, and, and, and that's going to kind of take us, what I'm going to start today is going to take us right up to and through Easter or Resurrection Sunday. You know, in December, um, last December, 2022, we observed a season, and we do this every year, but we observe this season in the life of the church, and we traditionally call this season of uh, four-ish weeks Advent, right? And so we did that uh, back then, which you may remember, I, I made mention of this back at the beginning of that series and that season. Advent, really, on the church calendar, it's the beginning of the new year. Like the new year, like, yeah, 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 new year starts January 1st. Oh, no, no, no. In the church calendar, the new year started in late November, early December with this season of Advent. And I mentioned back then that the church calendar begins with Advent. And I love this because it's a way of saying we are going to orient our entire lives, including time itself, around Jesus. Like everything's oriented, you get this, everything is, is oriented around the person of Jesus, even time itself, which I think is kind of the definition of being a disciple. A disciple, you could argue, is one who has chosen to what? Orient their entire lives, including what? Time itself around Jesus. And, and so this week, we are going to enter another one of those seasons it's a seven-week season that we're going to do, and what we're, we're going to attempt to do is simply maintain that same orientation. We're just going to continue to orient our church, our lives, our families, whatever, around Jesus, time itself. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this season. This might be new to some of you. This may harken back to uh, a while back in your life. It's a season called Lent, right? And it actually begins this week. You know, if Advent is a reminder that God is with us, which it is, this season we call Lent in the church is, is a reminder that God is for us. And we're going to be talking a lot about that for the next few weeks. Uh, full disclosure, I was not raised in a church tradition that recognized and participated in these seasons. Maybe you weren't either. Um, my understanding of Lent began and ended with my neighborhood best friend, Mike, whose family was Catholic, and he was always talking about this thing he would be at called Mass. Anybody, anybody have some familiarity with that? He was, he was, uh, we were from a Protestant family over there on Winding Trail. Mike, my best friend, lived on Wide Valley. He was Catholic, and all I knew is that at this one time of year, he could not eat meat on Fridays. That's all I, 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 under, I never asked why. To, I never understood why. I just knew if I was trying to share beef jerky with my best friend Mike on Fridays for about seven consecutive Fridays, he'd say no. And I would be like, why? Why can't you? Because it's Lent. And I was like, cool, let's go play. I had no idea why. Never even thought to ask him why. But I'm just saying, that, that was my understanding. That was about all I could have told you about this season. It, it really has been in middle adulthood, or I guess I could say middle age. Is that what I am now? Is that, I, think, I think I'm officially in that category. Middle, I said middle adulthood, but in my mind I'm thinking, no, you're middle aged. Um, it's, it's been in this season of my life that we'll call middle age um, that I've just really grown to appreciate this season and the invitation that this season brings uh, us in the life of the church. For me, it's an invitation just to slow down. It's an invitation to kind of center myself on the cross and the, and the empty tomb that I know is coming in seven-ish uh, weeks. It, it's a time to do some self-evaluation, which is so much fun, isn't it? it don't you love that? Uh, a seven-week period of self-evaluation where I get to slow down and really process. Yeah, why do I respond like that? Why do I say those sorts of things? Why is that just the, the, the kind of first thing that jumps to my mind in that situ, situation? And so that's kind of what this season is about. So we're going to get an early uh, jump start. Actually, it doesn't start until this Wednesday. Um, some of you, might, you'll, you'll, you'll pr perhaps see people and you'll wonder, why do they have a smudge on their forehead this Wednesday? You, and then it'll hit you. Oh, okay. It's Ash Wednesday, which starts the, the season uh, of Lent. And, and Ash Wednesday, if you're like, well, what's that all about? It's just a reminder that we're all what? We're all dust. It's where we begin. 
we're ash, we're dust, it's where all of this begins, and it's honestly, it's also where all of this ends, that from uh, dust we began, or ash we came into ash, or dust we shall return, um, which, lovely, is just another reminder of how little we're in control, right? I'm just dust, I break, I flake, I flake out, maybe you do too, Uh, I break down, I'm just dust, I'm imperfect, Uh, all of those things. I'm in so uh, little control of of so much as well as the dust that is others' lives as well. And so we're kind of right back to where we've been for the past few weeks there. And so Lent is many things, but I think one thing that Lent does, and we're going to hopefully experience this over the next seven weeks, is it disrupts the illusion or the facade that we can control whatever it might be that we are in control of whatsoever's going on around it. And I think what it does, too, is it puts us in a posture to just receive the gift, this gift, which is what God wants to give us through Jesus, this very moment, this, this next breath. I love that last song we sang, that this next, this breath that you've put in my lungs. And so what will I do with it? I'll pour out your praise. And I hope you were able to do that today. You know, even as we were singing that song uh, about the, the greatness of God and the breath, I had so many thoughts from what Zoe read in Psalm 19 to start off our worship time going through my head and all of creation pouring forth speech and pictures. Are you seeing some of these pictures of flowers that are beginning to erupt in the hills around here because we've had a substantial amount of rain this winter and, and green fields and flowers And I'm I'm picturing all of these, which have no voice, right? But what does the psalmist say they're doing? They're pouring forth speech. And then he puts the breath in our lungs because we have what? We have voice. We can give voice. I hope you're able to use your voice. If you just sat quietly today, I, I, I just hope that at some point you can use that breath in your lungs, which is the gift that's given to declare the greatness of God. Anyway, that's not at all what I want to talk about. So let's pray and we'll dive into this series Holy Spirit, thank you for this breath. Thank you for the next breath that you've put in our lungs. Thank you for this season, this time we have to center on the gift of your Son given to the world. A reminder that not only are you with us, you're for us. And so we give you this time. We ask for ears to hear in this room today, whatever spirit of God you want to say to us, and we'll give you all the glory and praise and honor forever and ever. Amen. Well, our journey through this season, uh, it's going to be done in conjunction with Jesus, um, which makes perfect sense. And specifically, we're going to be doing this with one particular New Testament author who tells us the stories of Jesus along one very specific, very particular, and consistent vein. Uh, That author is John, and so we're going to be dealing with some of John's gospel and some of the writings of John. John, as best we can tell, is the, the son of Zebedee, you might remember, had a brother named James, was one of the first four fishermen that Jesus calls to be. Uh, one of his disciples or first followers, likely is the one whose own uh, gospel, he in his own gospel, refers to himself, supposedly, as the beloved disciple or, you know, the one that Jesus loved, which is super convenient, right? When you're writing your own story and you refer to yourself in an ambiguous kind of third-person way as the one that Jesus loved or the beloved disciple. So, yeah, we're going to be reading that guy. And, and, and the Gospel of John, we won't have time in seven weeks to go through the entire Gospel. That would take us a year at least. Uh, but we're just going to kind of meander through part of it because John is brilliantly designed and, and masterfully laid out with really one purpose in mind. And, and John kind of plays his hand at the end of his Gospel, at the end of his writings. And so I, I want to kind of start at the end with something uh, that John says towards the end of his uh, story. And then we'll kind of back up And we'll go back to the beginning, and then we'll just kind of work our way through in seven weeks. Sound good? So let's start at the end. Uh, This is John chapter 20, starting in verse 30 and 31. Uh, the, The gospel writer says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written 
that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing uh, you may have life in his name. I mean, John tells us his purpose. I mean, this is the purpose. This is the purpose of so much of what John is writing about and, and, and what John is trying to articulate in his whole book. And at the very end, he kind of gives us this uh, roundabout purpose statement for this account of the life of Jesus. And, and that is, I'll bold it there, that we, the reader, might what? Believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Or another word for that in the Greek would be the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Messiah. Now that said, we need to be clear then by what John means by belief. When he says, my purpose is that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. What does John mean? What does John not mean? So let's go there to start. The, this belief, it, it, it's, it's not to be understood merely as some kind of intellectual exercise. Some kind of, well... Yeah, I can get with that intellectually. This is not mere uh, trying to affirm the, uh, some way Jesus' identity. That's not really what John has in mind when he uses that word belief. I get that. Is there a part of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I mentally I have mental assent to that. But really what John is getting at when he talks about belief, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, gosh, how would I say this? A more active belief. You know what I'm saying? It's a vibrant belief. It's a belief that actually does something with the knowledge. Like, like Jesus is the Messiah, so what? How does that change the way that you live? It's a belief that leads to some sort of action. That this reality, this truth has been given that should affect everything about how you live and what you do. Uh, and, and so it's an active kind of belief that he says leads to what? Life, life in his name, he says. And by life, and this is, a, uh, this is a phrase that John uses a lot in his gospel, by life he means eternal life. And, and let me say that a different way, an eternal kind of life. Because when John talks about life and, and eternal life, it's not just some kind of life that you get someday, some other place. What John means by life or eternal life is, is a kind of life that is breaking into the here and now, and that certainly will follow you into eternity, but is to be known and experienced when? Now, here and now. And so that's uh, the kind of life that John is talking about, that's found through belief in Jesus. He says, as heaven begins to invade earth in all sorts of ways now. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. So let's back up. Something else that John says in this little purpose statement, which is going to kind of serve as our guide for the next seven weeks. John makes reference to something that appears to be the catalyst of our belief. Or at least it has something to, it's catalytic. It's kind of pushing us toward belief, which becomes the impetus, he says, for our ability to have, like he says here, life in his name. And that something, or that some things, I'll bold it there, are what he calls signs. He says, Jesus performed many other signs. And then he comes back, but these, speaking of the signs, are written. Why? They become the catalyst for our belief, which is the impetus, he then says, for having life in his name. And so I think this would be a good time, because this is going to be some of the focus of what we're going to do. We just need to pause for a brief moment and talk about that word. What does he mean here by these things he calls signs? Uh, in the Greek, it's a word semea. Uh, it's a word that's kind of unique to John. John we'll, I'll show you the first time it's used in a moment earlier. But it's a way of, that John talks about the miraculous, the, the miracles. In the book of Acts, sometimes these are, this word signs is paired with another word, wonders, right? The signs and wonders that were performed by Jesus or the early uh, apostles or disciples. It's a, way of, then, so it's a way of talking about the miracles of Jesus. We could think about these signs as moments in time, because they always happen in time, in a particular place, where there is incredible change, right? 
Like something changes. There's incredible transformation of some sort or another. A story is going one way. Jesus steps in, does a sign, and all of a sudden something radically changes and the story is going a very different direction. And here's the point. It indicates something. It's a sign that points to something or it indicates God is at work. God is at work in the world right here in a profound way. Way. So I think there's two ways, that, two ways and, and, and maybe this is helpful, this will be a bit ambiguous, and then I'll get a little bit more specific. Uh, two ways, then, I think we can think about signs, or two ways, two of the points of a sign. Uh, number one, we can think about signs as points, reference points, or points of demarcation, right? It's kind of the nature, uh, a point of reference, it's kind of the point of a sign. That's, that's what any kind of sign does. They, it, it stands, a sign stands in a certain place, and tells you what? Something happened here. It's a sign. Or it points to like something is happening here. Or it's coming up in like 17 miles, right? I'm thinking of a road sign. That that coming up, it's a sign, and it's telling you in 17 miles something is coming. There's something there, and something is happening, or something there. So, So one way to think about a sign is it's a reference point. Or it's a point of demarcation, like it's happening here, X marks the spot. Are we tracking? Second way then, I think we can think about signs, is a sign, it's a means of pointing to a greater reality beyond it. Because you see, the sign is not necessarily the end, isn't it? Is it? It's not the point. The point is not the sign. You see this, oh, in 17 miles this is coming. You're not like, thank God I've arrived. Because the sign is doing what? pointing to a greater reality, something else that is coming beyond it. It points to what is. Now, if all that seems a bit opaque, let me try saying what I just said another way, using a a kind of sign that I think you know very well. How many of you are familiar with this particular sign? All right. And I tried to pick a sign with an arrow pointing somewhere. It's it's pointing somewhere. So let's do what I just said, those two things, and we'll use this particular real-life sign that's causing some of you to salivate even as you sit there, right? This sign stands as a reference point, does it not? A point of demarcation. X literally marks the spot, which is why you always did an in and out. Did you know that you got these palm trees with an X? You ever wondered why? That was the founding, the founder, the owner. That was some nod to a movie in the 60s. Talk to Wayne after. He seems to know what the movie was, where in the movie there was an X that marked the spot of some treasure. So the founder, Snyder was his name, right? Decided that at every in and out he would put two crisscrossing trees so that you knew X marks the spot to get the what? Best hamburger the world's ever seen, right? Literally, that's why they have those there. It's a point of demarcation. The sign points to something, that, this, that, that something is happening here, right here, something's happening, or, or right over there, something is going on. But I dare say, none of you go there for the sign, do you? <laughs> do any of you go to In-N-Out and just go and stand, because you're like, I just love to stand by the sign, because it really is beautiful, I mean, it's great. You look at the sign, none of you go there for the sign, because the In-N-Out sign is not the point, is it? takes me to number two. The sign's pointing to a greater reality. (gasps) If you follow the sign, it will take you to something beyond the sign, something far more fulfilling and satisfying, I dare say, right, that the sign is pointing you to. Because if you follow that particular sign, it leads you where? To the double-double, to the animal-style fries, to the milkshake. It it leads you there. And so the sign is not the point. It's a reference point. But it's pointing you to a a reality beyond it that's taking you to something far more satisfying. How are we doing? Are we tracking? Now, the whole point of the signs. Let's go back to Jesus now. That John says this whole thing's going to be about signs. The whole point of the signs or the miracles that Jesus does in the Gospel of John are to point us to a greater reality, which is in fact what? 
Jesus. It's pointing back to Jesus and the kingdom of God that's breaking in through the ministry of Jesus. These are moments in particular places where heaven and earth are intersecting, which may be what you feel like when you enter an in and out as well, right? How many of you have that experience? You're like, when I bite into that double-double, I have an experience where it's like heaven and earth are intersecting for a moment. When I get that first taste, there is something going on. And that's what the signs, John says, are about. The miracles of Jesus, let's just get this crystal clear. They are not the end and of themselves. They're not even the point. They're pointing us to the work of God in the world, and they're calling forth belief in Jesus as Messiah that's going to lead ultimately to what? Life in him. That's the point of the miracle. That's the point of the sign. And John actually says, I'll go back to him again, that Jesus actually performed many other signs, which are not even in this book, he says. He's just going to give us a handful. And he says, Jesus actually did so many more, but he says the ones that we are going to read about, he says, are so that the reader, which is us, might believe and have life in his name. And so we're going to spend the the next seven weeks just talking about seven of those, seven of the signs, because a good portion of John's gospel revolves around telling those seven stories. And get this, there are seven weeks in this season we call Lent, which seems to match up perfectly with these seven signs. Oh, but there is an eighth one, and that involves an empty tomb. It's like it all leads to life. Where is, this, where this is all going. So we're calling this signs of life. Signs of life. Seeing the glory of Christ in the gospel of John. And, and that's what we're going to do. Um, and, and the first one. The first one of these signs. Because like I said, we, we went to the end where he tells us, these are all these signs I've been telling you about. This is what this is about. And, and there's lots more. But then let's back up to the first one. And the first one's in John 2. And I just want to read it real quickly, make a couple observations about that, and then we'll ask the Spirit to do whatever the Spirit of God wants to do in us, and, and that'll be it. We'll get ready for a Bible 101 class. Sound good? Uh, so the first sign that we're going to look at is in John chapter 2, and that's where we'll spend the rest of our time. Like I said, it's really the first time this word sign is ever used. And so let's just read it in its entirety, and we'll see where we go. It says this, On the third day... A wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now, draw out some, take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water, well, they knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you, you've saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. I mean, it's all there, isn't it? It's just all there. There's literally 20 different directions we could take this. I know some of you are like, you've heard 20 different sermons, maybe, on this particular miracle. It's a pretty familiar one, but I just want to give a couple observations. Did you catch the commentary there, though, that uh, we're given at the end, end of the whole scene? At the end of the whole scene, he tells us that what we just read about, what took place at a particular place, at a wedding in Cana, was the first of the what? That is the first of the signs. Remember at the end? Lots of signs, he says. It's the first one. It's the first of the signs. And if an author tells you that it's the first of something, you can assume what? If there's a first, there's going to be a... 
Well, there's going to be at least a second, right? Kind of like if you're the firstborn, everyone's assuming there's more, right? You know, like if you're an only child, you go around, anyone an only child, you go around saying you're the firstborn? No, you don't call yourself that. Huh? But if you're a first, that assumes there's going to be a second. Well, maybe there's going to be a third, a fourth, and a fifth as well. Who knows? So John's like, this is just the first one, first of the signs that are going. And this first sign, or this first reference point, let's go back to our two things about signs and in and out. This is our first reference point, our first point uh, of demarcation, right here in this place, John says. It, it, it happened right here in a very specific place, at a wedding in a place called Cana, because, and I think this is important, the work of God, which I said is what a sign is always about, though God is at work here, that's always particular and it's always localized. It's always in a particular place. No, 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 no. It happened right here at this wedding in this little village, which is just like a tiny little map dot in a corner of a region called Galilee. John's telling us, the work of God was on display here in this small village at a, at, a, at a wedding of an unknown couple. We don't even know the couple's name. We don't even know why Jesus and his disciples were there because that's not the point. But at this place, at this wedding, sometime along this couple's week-long wedding celebration, which is what a traditional Jewish wedding would have been, about a week long, somewhere in the week, he says, this thing happened. This sign went down. Because apparently somewhere toward the end of the week, it says, the wine was running low and the dance floor was getting pretty sparse, right? I mean, you know that moment when the DJ's starting to panic at the wedding because everybody's starting to leave the dance floor and the DJ's like, well, what am I going to do here? Uh, that's like when it's time for the YMCA, right? Everybody now, let's do the YMCA or the cha-cha slide or... You got to put on something to keep the people dancing, right? Keep them on the dance. Macarena, you remember that one? Everybody will do it. There's just certain songs with if the DJ wants to keep them there, the chicken dance. Yeah, do the chicken dance. Do something. Keep them going. Wine is running out. Everybody's starting to go home. It's actually getting watery. That's what they would do. They just water down the wine as the celebration. Serve the best stuff first. We're at day four. A ton of water in that. Just water it down, water it down, water it down. But people are starting to leave. They're running out of wine. Until Jesus, at the beckoning of his own mother, I'm always, I always find that interesting, this little aside that like John is like, oh, Mary was there too. Oh, Joseph, just Mary was there. Other reasons for that probably. At the beckoning of his own mother, he does the miraculous. But it's not even really about that because John spends very, very, very little time there's no big prayer, there's no incant, there's no nothing. There's no like, and then he waved his arms. It's almost like an aside. Just like, ah, fill the jars with water. That's not even the point. And they do that. And suddenly, the dance floor is hopping again, isn't it? And the DJ is breathing a sign of relief, a sigh of relief, because this sign has, has gone down. And we're told that it's right there, at that place, on that dance floor, heaven and earth intersect. With that couple, to save that couple, the social disgrace that would have come upon their entire family for running out of wine at the, on the biggest week-long celebration of their life, at that place, Jesus chose to reveal what John says is his glory on the dance floor. Don't you love that about our Savior? It's right there on the floor with wine. He does it all there. Heaven meets earth in this mysterious kind of way. And it's a sign, John says. It's an indication that God is at work. The kingdom of heaven is invading a dance floor. It's invading a wedding party right here. And yet the point, let me go back to this, the point is not that Jesus can do some really cool stuff with water. And he probably should bottle the stuff and sell it because it's just that good. Imagine how we could market this thing, right? Right? I mean, that's not the point at all. It's not the point of the miracle. It's not the point of the sign that, oh, look, Jesus can do something crazy cool with water. That's not the point. Jesus tells us the point, and I'll bold it again there in verse 11. He tells us the point. He says, this is the first through which he what? It's to reveal his glory. And so his disciples would believe in him and have life in his name, which is what he tells us at the end. Because remember that every sign is pointing us to a greater reality. 
Everything is pointing. It's calling for belief that leads to life. It says Jesus' glory is revealed. I like to think of it like, like the curtain was pulled back a little bit. For the first time, for the first time for those disciples and for everybody there, including his own mom, the, 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 the curtain was pulled back a little bit, revealing a, a little bit more of who, not Jesus is, let me take this a step further, who God is and what God is like. Because remember from John chapter 1, we didn't even go there. We'll go there next week. John in chapter 1 tells us, who is this? This is God in human form. This is the word who has become flesh and shows up in the flesh at a wedding and reveals his glory. No, 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 no. This is what God is like. This goes much, much bigger, does it not? And, and, and that's a little bit, I think, of what it talks about, is revealing his glory. We'll spend more time on that word glory. It's a key theme. It's what the signs are about. The signs reveal the glory of God. And so we'll spend some time there as we move through the other six. But at a cursory level, um, for week one, a, a week one level, we'll call that that, Lent week one level, uh, let's just think of glory as this one. The nature of the love of God, one way that the nature of the love of God for the world is revealed. I like that. And I didn't come up with that. But one scholar I read this week said, the glory of God, it's like the way that the nature of the love of God for the world is revealed. I think sometimes we can hear words like glory, and they're almost too weighty, aren't they? A little too ethereal, too transcendent. Our oldest child, that's her middle name, if you didn't know that, Grace. We, could never, we couldn't come up with a middle name until a few days before she was born. We went through all these different middle names. Grace Gaines, what goes with Grace Gaines? Grace Gaines. If you're watching Grace online, bless you. Um, and we finally went with Grace Glory Gaines. Glory, the nature of the love of God, the way that the nature of the love of God is revealed to the world. I'm like, I like we like that glory. But it can feel so like transcendent, can it? So kind of ethereal, um, like, like something that's so far out of reach uh, for us even to fathom. Um, I, I like the way one of my professors, though, at, at Fuller, Marianne Mai Thompson, in her commentary on the Gospel of John, she talks about glory, the glory that's revealed at, by this first sign And she talks about it this way. She says that Jesus' glory is not revealed in his sheer power to transform water into wine. That's not the glory. She says it's the glory is is Jesus' incredible act of generosity and abundance to provide far superior wine for this couple. And, and, And I think there's a point to that. Because it all points to Jesus. And like I just said, which then shows us who God is and what God is like. And so we can say it shows us his glory that our God is what? Generous. And our God is abundant. I mean, did you catch the comment about the quality of the wine? The quality of the wine. It's what? It's like the best wine, he says. This ain't no three-buck check from Trader Joe's. He's like, no, 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 no. This was like the best stuff for last. Like, where did you get this? The, the wine steward says. Where did you get this stuff? The quality. It's, it far surpasses anything. Or did you, did, you, did you catch the comment about the quantity also, the abundance? So there's generosity. I mean, the quality that you brought out. It's incredible. And then it's abundance. Did you catch that? Six stone jars, 20 to 30 gallons each. You can do the math. We're talking 120 to 180 gallons of wine, right? That's going to keep the party going for a while. If you've got that much of the finest wine on hand. In the pagan day, or in the pagan world of Jesus' day, wine was, was often connected uh, to this, this guy. You may be familiar with him. The pagan god Dionysus, the pagan god uh, of wine and, and, and wine was often used in abundance. You can read accounts of this at the uh, festivals for this pagan god Dionysus. And so in the Greco Roman world, wine was always connected uh, to him. And you can read accounts, I find this fascinating historical accounts that say that at, that at one particular festival of Dionysus, 
Uh, there are all those who say that at this one festival of Dionysus, they, they, there was three stone water jars that were completely empty and sealed that were sitting in a room at the festival. And, and when the people came in the next day, those three stone jars were brimming with what? Wine. Because Dionysus had provided wine in abundance, generously at this, this pagan festival. And so that's how the, the, the story goes then about Dionysus, three vats brimming with wine. Now, why do I find that fascinating? Because I wonder for the original hearers who grew up in the Greco-Roman world around that story and these people, I wonder for them if it's not lost that the sign that Jesus does at this wedding feast is to say, what? oh yeah, 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 I've heard the story about Dionysus and the three vats of wine, how about six? What if I don't... Jesus does something that, that far surpasses, that doubles this pagan myth going around about Dionysus' ability to transform empty jugs into wine. That's just an aside. The original Jewish audience, would they have heard even that? And I also wonder, maybe they have remember what the prophets like Isaiah wrote about God's abundant provision about choice wine. This is Isaiah 25 where the prophet is talking about what the kingdom of God will be like. What is it like? What is God's kingdom like? What is God's salvation like? And the prophet says this, on this mountain, this particular geographical localized place, the Lord Almighty says, I will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of what? Aged wine. Oh, what kind of wine? The best of meats and the finest of wine. Again, no three buck check at this thing. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Isaiah says, what's the kingdom of God like? What's God's salvation going to be like, he says? Oh, like a feast. Dare I say a wedding feast? A banquet? We can go to Revelation and find that imagery too, can't you? It's going to be like this feast, he says, with incredible food, a banquet, he says, with the finest of what? Wines. You can literally read that Hebrew this way. The mountains shall drip sweet wine. It's going to be like, oh, it's going to be like the, mount, like the mountains will be dripping the choicest of wine. This is the life that's really life, isn't it? It's a picture in it all. This, even in the prophet, what is this? It's a sign. It's a picture. It's pointing us to a greater reality. This is what God is like. This is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what it's like when heaven intersects earth. And did you notice in the prophet what the prophet says it will abolish? what it will do away with, this kingdom, what, it, what it's going to swallow up, what it's going to do away with. There's no, it's like the prophet saying, there's no room for this in this kingdom. It's going to go. It's got to go. No room at this feast. He says, God's abundant provision of the finest wine, it's linked to the abolition of death, isn't it? It's going to swallow up death forever. Now I ask you, is it any coincidence that Jesus' first sign is the provision of like mountains dripping with the sweetest of wine, which will set the stage, remember, it's the first, more to come, it's going to set the stage for more signs to come that's ultimately going to lead us to the resurrection of Jesus, the final sign, which happens to be the abolition of what? Where he swallows up death forever. Come on now. I mean, you can't, you can't, it's like the, the way the Bible links things and the way this, I mean, you gotta go. This, this, this will be plenty of material for a Bible 101 workshop after, after service, right there. I mean, it's all right there. You just start following those things and tracing those interconnections and, and, oh, one more, and, and, and this is too good. When does John, let's go back to John chapter 2 now. When does John tell us this sign took place? Come on now. On a third day, 
on the third day, this all went down. It's like echo, 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 echo. Oh, it, it happened on the third day. Echo. Where, the, where death is abolished forever. Too good. Too good. And we, here's the good news. We're invited into this banquet to sit at this feast where we can participate in this same reality, not someday by and by, now. That's the gospel. That's the good news because that's, remember, the point of the sign. It points us to a reality greater than it, far beyond it. It points us to where the life is at, life found in trusting this same Jesus to do in us what he's done in the wine. You know, we just spent the last seven weeks of this new year talking about the possibility of change, right? Transformation. How do we transform? How Jesus, we literally said, Jesus can change and transform anything and anyone. And it seems to me that in some kind of way, Jesus is not letting us away from that. It's like we we can't get away from that theme because it's here again. This first sign is all about a glorious transformation that takes place when Jesus shows up and when Jesus is allowed to do whatever Jesus wants to do in our lives. But there's one last thing I want to point out as we start this seven-week journey that's eventually going to lead us to a cross and an empty tomb. Yes, Jesus is present, and I believe he's still present today, to abundantly provide, generously provide. Yes, Jesus is present to change and to transform, and I'll even say to do the miraculous in our presence today, to bring heaven to earth right here in the middle of this dance floor, this space. It's all here. Same Jesus. It's all there. But if I go back to John 2, all of that happened All of that was initiated because a couple of unnamed servants took Mary at her word, do whatever he tells you. And I can't get away from that either. I mean, you can talk about this as theory and be like, yeah, 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 Jesus can do anything. He can transform and change. He's going to abundantly provide. He's going to, and then, but all of that is, the entire sign is initiated with some unnamed servants who take Mary at her word. Do whatever he tells you. And what does he tell them to do? Uh, Go fill those jars with water. And if they had been like, what if it was so ridiculous? So absurd. No. They just do it. And it initiates the miraculous. And, 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 and And so I'm led to wonder, maybe that's our role today. And maybe that's the word for us today. The glory of God will be revealed, can be revealed in your family, in your marriage, in your life. Heaven can meet earth in all sorts of ways for you and I today. But it all happens when we what? Do whatever he tells us, whatever that might be. We believe that God wants to reveal his glory continue to reveal his glory through Jesus here, particularized, localized in this place within us. And so we're going to continue to ask him to do just that. Rainier, I have said enough for week one. Let's do this. Um, But this is just, there's, there's six more. This is just the first one. And there's six more that are going to reveal the glory of Jesus so that we might believe Jesus is the Messiah, so that we might have what? Life in his name. Uh, That's where this is going. Can we just sit for a moment? And Rainier, as you get ready, let's just ask the Spirit of God to come and do in us now, in this place, this moment, here, whatever needs to be done, just to give us ears, to hear whatever he might be telling us to do. And so Holy Spirit, would you come and speak to your church now? Would you show us your glory by, by giving us the courage 
and the stamina to continue to do whatever you're telling us to do. And in a room like this, I know that that is, there is just not one thing. There are so many things you're calling. You're calling people away from certain things. You're calling people to lay certain things down. Can you give that up? Can you, can you set that aside? Can you stop believing that about yourself? That about him or her? So come and speak to your church today. Reveal your glory in this place that we might have life in your name. Lord, we pray for signs. Pray for wonders. Pray that you would intersect our humanity with your power set people free to restore brokenness would you begin for some of us just begin to do that work in us today a sense of what the Spirit's calling you to do, I just encourage you, step there quickly. Do that quickly. You're likely being given an invitation for, for the Spirit of God to do something powerfully in your life, but you need to respond to that quickly. Don't sit on it. Don't wait till tomorrow. Respond today. Whatever that is. I, don't, I mean, I have no idea what that might be. But I just want to encourage you. Take action quickly. Remember, this is belief that's always active. It's not just, yeah, I should do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I gotta stop doing that so much. It's like, if, you got, if the Spirit has, has like put the Spirit, you know, like the, just kind of highlighted something, you know how that happens? Where you're just like, I just know that I know that I know I'm supposed to, that's, that's, that's it for me. I just encourage you to respond quickly to that. Anything else in the room? We got a few minutes. We don't have to like rush told the pizza and everything I'm coming for like 20 more minutes so we got time we'll set all that up in like 20 minutes I know some of you hear from the Lord very clearly <laughs> others of you you're like is that me or is that God I don't know I've, I've learned to trust the Spirit's ability to pinpoint some things in me more than my ability to get it wrong I just go with it very encouraging. Respond quickly. Do whatever he tells you. Fill that jar up with water. Like, I don't even know why I'm filling it up with water. Okay, just do it. Your job isn't to do the sign. It's just to fill the water jar. Anybody else? I did not respond to something in worship that I felt I was supposed to respond to quickly. So I'll just put full disclosure. So I'll say it now. Um, we were singing a song in worship about God reigning above it all. Remember that one? 
And I got the sense that for some of us, um, that's not quite the truth. You know what I mean? Like we sing, you reign above it all, but for some of us, you're like, but not this. Like, this I reign over. We're back to the control thing. I reign over this. This is the part of my life I reign over, you reign over it. And, and, and I got the sense of what God wanted us to say, no, no, it's everything. The kingdom of God, what God wants is to reign over it all. And whatever that means for whatever it is in the room, I don't know, but I just felt like I was supposed to say that. Give, give it all. Let him reign over it all. And I got the sense, too, that maybe there's a few or one or I don't know how many people in the room that are like, could he reign even over this? Because that seems like too much. You don't understand. I, in this area, it's a mess. So what would that look like? I don't know. I have no idea what that is. I mean, I can throw out the typical thing like, over my finances, you reign above it all because <laughs> it's a mess. Could you reign even over our finances, over my finances, over my relationship with this particular child this really do you reign over that because I'll give you that but that one's hard I'm gonna keep that one I'm gonna keep hold of that one you know what I'm saying does that hit anyone like you reign can we let's sing that then could, could we end by singing that song again and if that if that's a response and maybe what you need to do as a response if that's you is just open-handed all Tom Dunn's here I, I never can get away from those poker chips I'm all in, all in. It's like, I can't, I can never get away from that. It's like every time, what does he ask for? All. I'm all in.